Hey guys, welcome back to The Great Escape. If you want to save some money when you're shuttling your funds around the world, sending money overseas to friends or family or paying for things, don't do anything before you check out thegrayescape.com forward slash cash because you can get a free transfer worth at least 500 pounds, which depending on where we're at, how many days and months and years away from Brexit we are, uh, can be a vastly different amount of money in your currency. I did a ton of research before bringing these guys on board as a sponsor, and I use them myself for my travels when I need to pay a bill back in England or I'm there and I need to pay something in America. That's thegrayescape.com forward slash cash, and it's gray with an A, but you know that. You're regulars. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about why it's been a while right after this. (sighs) What can I say? It has been a while. I know it's been a while. And every day I have thought about posting this episode since my very last episode, which was several months ago with the fantastic and fabulous Howard Hughes, who has his own podcast called The Unexplained. Um, Life happened. And I guess when you combine unexpected random events in life with somebody who's a bit of a perfectionist, Like myself, I kept thinking, well, I can't put the episode up because it means I'll have to rush. I won't be ready. And days turned into weeks, turned into months. Uh, It's been a period of the most change I've ever gone through in my entire life on all fronts Um, with losing a loved one, uh, dealing with that, which I'm truthfully still dealing with, as you would know if you've lost somebody close to you in your life. It's very, very difficult or a family member. Um, It's hard, possibly one of the hardest things. So there's that. Um, I've moved. I'm in a new place now. My place has been under construction. There's been a lot of noise. And that has been uh, the best excuse ever to procrastinate because there's been banging. Everything's been going on in the house. Um, So I couldn't record. I couldn't do the recording. And I kept thinking, well, if the sound's not perfect, I don't want to do it. And it's at the point now I'm still under construction on every level. I, as a human being, am still under construction, which hopefully we all are if we're honest with ourselves. My home is under construction. Um, Life went from being very hard and tragic to having some pretty major blessings in it, which is always nice to restore your faith that maybe there is some kind of silent, mysterious, unspoken circle that winds its way throughout our lives, bringing with it glaring horror followed by some good tidings. So I'm on a little bit of the good tidings side of things right now, which is why I thought, you know what, let's just get this episode up. And it's a fantastic episode with a, with Mike Booth. Mike returns today for this interview, which was recorded in his hotel room in London. And uh, full disclosure, there's probably some strange uh, things that happen in the interview because we have, uh, I think room service plays a role at some point. And he has his um, his daughters with us uh, sitting on the bed, which is very adorable. So it's Mike and his daughters And um, my partner in crime, Jason, is also on hand listening in on the interview and helping out. What else can I say? This guy is a spiritual VIP. There, There are so few people you meet in life who become that classic pebble in the pond where, you know, the pebble in the pond, you do something in your life and it makes a little series of ripples And you don't know how far those ripples are going to go. It could be you helping someone across the street and maybe that person goes on and does something different in their day because you helped them across the street. And suddenly you've changed the world and all you did was help somebody across the street. This is what I mean when I say the ripples in the pond, the pebble in the pond. Mike Booth is a mofo 
pebble. Uh, he made some decisions in his life and now his products are in over 50 countries. They're changing people's life. They're helping people see and think and feel differently. And depending on how open you are in your own life, where you're at on your journey, being open to thinking and feeling differently and taking in a new type of information that affects how you live your life can be tremendously impactful and positive for you and for everybody around you. There's a lot of that happening on the planet right now. So I don't want to go on too much more about Mike other than that if you suddenly think, oh, I didn't listen to the other episodes, that's episode 36 and 42. They're both about Orosoma and can give you a bit of a heads up on things. But um, basically, in a nutshell, Orosoma makes holistic products that contain the energies of crystals, plants and color with the intention to positively impact and support not only individuals, but the entire planet. And Mike, with the support of his wife, Claudia, they have the second largest biodynamic farm in the UK, 450 acres of land, tended to fully in accordance with nature and the universe itself. Crops planted with lunar alignments, all done with the utmost respect and love. So without further ado, I'd like to bring in uh, the main man himself in his hotel room in London. And uh, you'll hear Lilith and Jess, his two beautiful daughters, and uh, and Jason a little bit as well. And that's it. Here he is, the uh, spiritual VIP himself, Mr. Mike Booth. <laughs> It's funny, I keep looking at your wallpaper, which to me, I've been suddenly fascinated by microscopes and it looks like like blood platelets <laughs> on the wall. It looks... I was l- looking at a lot of things from holographs from dolphins yesterday. Have you seen those? No. It's basically very similar to my paintings and uh, these are the ways dolphins communicate holographically. Oh, hang on a minute. This was covered in our sound episode. Um, we interviewed John Stuart Reed, who's a pioneer in cymatics, and he's done um, collaborations with the, the site speakdolphin.com, mm. mm. and he's actually used his cymoscope to decode the echolocation the same stuff. into pictures, yeah. and he's made 3D pictures yeah. of what the dolphin can I remember see. you mentioned mm. when, when you saw my painting something about these that look very much like soundscapes. Cymatics, yeah. yes. Yes, they did look like si- soundscapes. Mm. But that's what your wallpaper looks like. It's some zoom in of chromosomes or <laughs> something, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, just before we uh, got settled with our teas and coffees, you were telling a pretty awesome story very casually and spontaneously about your very first near death experience at age 11. So I wonder if you can possibly recap. Yeah, basically, I was on the, the way to uh, Cubs, you know, the junior version of the, the Scout and uh, 11 years old, um, there was a roundabout where the the bus stop uh, was. I crossed the roundabout and expected the bus to stop at the stop, but it didn't. Uh, there, there wasn't anybody waiting, so probably he was just going to carry on. And so uh, I ended up with my left foot underneath the, uh, the, the bus and uh, then... The next thing I knew, I was seeing myself lying on the back seat of the bus uh, with somebody uh, with a pair of surgical uh, scissors removing my plimsoll from uh, what was a very squidged foot. Uh, Within a few minutes, uh, my mother uh, appeared. Um, She'd obviously been called and had had run, which was about a a 10-minute run, and she wasn't particularly a runner, Uh, She'd ended up uh, getting there very, very quickly. She called my name, and at the moment that she called my name, I had the very strong sensation of being reassociated with the body, coming into the body as a request uh, from my mother, which was all very, very, you know, pertinent and very powerful at the time. That particular day, uh, there were no beds in a hospital ward for children in emergency, 
and so I ended up being taken into a geriatric ward. Opposite me there was a, an old man uh, uh, lying there and uh, it was, uh, you know, a fairly peaceful situation. I remember drifting off to sleep and feeling, you know, pretty OK considering uh, what it was that had happened. I remember, um, you know, the the sense of uh, having the, the morphine injection and uh, and the diminishing pain uh, as the, uh, the, the sense of body numbness came on. In the middle of the night in this uh, dimly lit, uh, as it was to me at the time, uh, a green ward, uh, waking up and seeing what looked like a, a white football above the, the bed opposite me. And I thought, what's that? You know, what is it that, that can be there? No idea. You know, never seen anything like it. Uh, in this sort of dim green light. And then this uh, white ball bounced onto the floor and went down to the end of the ward, which, you know, basically later on I found out was where the toilets were. And then after a few minutes it bounced back again, back onto his bed and hovered above his bed. And then, as though it was that uh, something uh, had really happened, it was like a, a click or a crack uh, in uh, sound terms. Uh, and this white ball suddenly disappeared out of the window which was above the bed. At the same time, all the lights and the, uh, the sounds came on uh, on the monitors that he was attached to and immediately the night nurses uh, came around, put curtains around the bed and that's the, the last thing I remember about that particular situation until I woke up in the morning and uh, when, I, when I came to, they'd woken me for some, something to eat or uh, some breakfast type of experience and what I saw then was that there was nobody in the bed. My uh, first request to the nurse was what happened to the the man that was there in the bed overnight had a you know kind of a as an 11 year old uh, a kind of sense of concern and she said oh he went in the night and I didn't really know what to even she meant by that right. I didn't really understand I asked my parents when they came later what did it mean you know right you it might, might be he went home <laughs> yeah and so what do you think you actually saw? What was the white football? Well, I think it was his, his vital essence or his consciousness leaving the physicality. I mean, that's, you know, I've had similar experiences since of that type of thing, but that was the first time I'd actually witnessed somebody dying. I don't think many people experience watching somebody die right. uh, at that sort of age. Talking to Vicky Wall, you know, many, many years later, sort of in my early 30s, and she talked about uh, very often during the war she saw people uh, dying and she talked about the different points of exit on the body where the consciousness or the, the white ball left. And, you know, that was very coherent with the experiences that I'd had at that point right. in time. Sometimes she said, you know, if the soul uh, was leaving towards an exalted uh, parting, then it left through the top of the head. If it was that it was uh, dying in trauma, then it would leave from the side of the body. Mm. And if it was that it was going into some sort of traumatic death that was also to do with some, you know, bad deed, then it could also leave out of uh, the orifice at the bottom of the body. Wow. And such a young child at age 11, I mean, when your mum then said, well, this person passed away, mm. what did you make of it then? Or did you tell her what you'd seen? Yes, and I mean, she was, you know, she was sort of fairly confirmative that, you know, what I'd seen was the way it was. You know, she seemed to know that uh, that her perception or uh, the way I'd describe things were from a child's eyes, what she understood from her own experience. And was this something that you would go on to discuss with school friends or was it a bit like keep hush about this because not everybody's on board with this? No, I definitely got the impression fairly early on, even while I was still in the hospital, um, talking to the man who was next to me who was a postman that had been bitten by a dog, uh, that this definitely wasn't something to be discussed. Right. This wasn't for down at the <laughs> pub. <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, you mentioned multiple uh 
near-death experiences early, early on. So yeah. you can start wherever you want. But I, I would love to hear all about them, yours and Vicky's. Yeah, my, my second one was a, a sailing accident. Um, I was trained um, in sailing by our next-door neighbour who was a druid. And uh, if you've ever come across the uh, work of Ursula Le Guin, the wizard, wizard of Ursi, she talks about the training of Jed, the... Uh, the young mage that was in that. Well, my training with this druid was very similar. It was based in nonverbal communication while sailing. And uh, one of the events during that training was that I was hit by the boom of the the boat on the the back of the head, knocked unconscious for a few moments and ended up upside down in the water. And uh, Howard, the, uh, the, the man that rescued me, um, he got me to the shore and uh, did mouth to mouth. And again, I was witnessing myself going through the whole of that process and him saving me and seeing at that stage far more luminous fibres and all sorts of stuff um, that were going on that connected me to him and uh, how it was that uh, it was it was very much something that was like a, an amplification of that first experience mm. but much more graphic much more vivid and uh, much more mature if you like so what did it look like then well it was it was basically this uh, this consciousness that was the awareness that was outside the body was linked to the physicality by luminous threads and these luminous fre- threads were you know whether they were going to detach or not seemed to be whether or not there was going to be survival Mm. And I had that strong sense that if they let go, then I would be gone. It would be like I would be disappearing. And who's and the they? These luminous threads. The, oh, the actual threads themselves, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then as it was that he breathed into me and I breathed his breath and I came back into the physicality, so these fibres got stronger and I felt a very strong connection and perception from the centre of his body mm. and the centre of my body at that point in time with these luminous fibres that somehow became charged through that whole experience. Mm. I wonder if it would have even helped the fact you were in water because water amplifies, doesn't yeah. it? So maybe... I mean, I've no idea about that, but it was definitely... To me, it was an initiation of some sort at another level of being that was necessitated by that near-death experience. The second one of the three was definitely the one which I think was initiatory. I mean, that would kind of probably change anyone for the rest of their life and experience like that. Yeah, I mean, it was was definitely something that precipitated much more in the creativity. I definitely went through a leap in my desire and need to create at that point Mm -hmm. in time. My drawings went through radical change and, you know, the the whole of what I wanted to express creatively, also the need for it went through a big change. It wasn't something up till that point in time other than what I loved to do. It wasn't the sense I had to do it, whereas after that time I had to do it. Mm. Then the third one that I had was a car accident. I was in my early 20s. I was with my best friend at the time. Uh, we were driving, a, a, he was driving a, an A30 and uh, it was painted in red and yellow, which I think is also significant, uh, uh, red and yellow dinosaurs. Um, we were both at uh, the first year of teacher training college after art college. And um, What do you mean, red and yellow dinosaurs? Well, that's what he painted the car in. It was, they you were, mean he put dinosaurs yeah, on the car? yeah. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound very cool it was for very, a grown-up. It was very cool. It sounds good if you're time. 12. No, it was very cool. They're, they're, I mean, dinosaurs, you know, can have all sorts of things. You could say they were dragons, but they weren't. They were dinosaurs. It was called po- Did you think it was cool? Yeah, I did think it was cool at the time. I mean, he was he was a musician and he was, you know, uh, coming out of a Salvation Army background and I think his rebellion was probably as strong as any uh, that I knew at art college or teacher training college against what the background that he was coming out of. So the red and, di- red and yellow dinosaurs <laughs> were part of that rebellion, I think. You know, it was part of what It does he- sound rebellious. It was, it was. <laughs> and anyway, we hit this lamppost on an icy road and um, 
the the car was a complete write-off. I ended up going through the windscreen, over a hedge and into a field. And my sense and perception was that two light beings caught me each arm and placed me in the field. I didn't have any injuries, not a scratch, nor a broken bone. Nothing uh, was wrong with me at all. I came to very, very quickly and wondered how I'd got into the field until I later recalled what it is that I'd perceived during that experience. He never got better from that. He was basically in a coma for a long time and still, you know, he he never uh, really recovered. Oh, my goodness. He was the driver. He was the driver, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Mm. And uh, coincidentally, my brother-in-law was the one who picked up the car and he didn't believe anybody could have survived at all who'd been in that car because the lamppost ended up pushing the engine into the passenger (gasps) compartment. Oh, my gosh. It was one of those really solid concrete lampposts. Oh, boy. I mean, so what did you think after this? I mean, you must have been a little bit freaked out at this point that you've had three near-death experiences. Yeah, and I think that basically that one really sobered me for a long, long time because of what happened to him. And, you know, it was also, in a sense, predictive and preparatory for what was to happen with my eldest son and, you know, his him going into coma and the whole difficulty of... Uh, you know, the the car accident or, you know, what what it was that I described to you mm. last time. Mm-hmm. Mm. Wow. And so when you, which we uh, heard wonderfully how you met uh, Vicky before, but at what point did you guys discuss these near-death experiences? Well, I mean, I talked to you about the, the, the morning walk. She had no choice other than to do those walks to, to keep the function of the 40% of her heart that was still intact. So during those morning walks, you know, we would discuss all of these things to do with my experience, to do with her experiences of what it was that she'd perceived at the various points in her journey uh, when it was that she'd come close to, to death. I mean, as it was that she... Uh, entered the diabetic phase, then she'd also gone into out-of-body experience uh, through hyperglycemia and perceived her physicality uh, in a state of uh, complete trauma. Seeing everything that was wrong and what was to come in terms of the deterioration of the physical organs of the body and knowing that was the situation that she was facing while it was she was out of the body, before it was that she was discovered and given the appropriate uh, uh, medicine, the appropriate injection that brought her back into being. And how far off, what point in her life was that? How many years after that did she She was late onset diabetic, you know, and all of the things that happened to her, the loss of the sight, were the consequence of that uh, diabetes. She was given an experimental medication, uh, Rastanol, and uh, that had led to the bleeding behind the eye that led to the blindness. And after she created the equilibrium bottles, did she use them herself for her diabetes? Yes, every day. And during the time that I was with her, the seven years, seven days a week, I would say probably for the first five years she was self-maintaining without insulin, uh, largely uh, completely independent. It was only in the last couple of years as it was that she got, uh, uh, let's say, more and more frail that... uh, Uh, She felt quality of life and uh, cakes and things were more important (laughs) than it was the maintenance of uh, the continuity of life, almost like she was prepared to let go, knowing Mm. knowing at some level that there would be continuity with her life's work. Mm. She probably already felt comforted that she'd passed it on enough to you. And, of course, the cake. all, All around the same time. Right. I mean... You know, different levels of experience, aren't they? You know, what it is that happens uh, with somebody in that sort of situation, some conscious, some not conscious, what it is that occurred. You know, she had a passion for, um, you know, ice cream, a passion for cream cakes, uh, scones and things like that, uh, which were, you know, compensatory eating. I started off as a 24-inch waist. By the time I'd been with her for a couple of years, I was already up to 36. 
Mm. So, you know, that was pretty fast. Do you still have cakes? Um, yes, I mean, you know, I, I think that part of the inheritance, you know, is also you learn uh, pictures of behaviour uh, through those you associate with mm. most closely. And I spent a lot of time learning that glycemic pattern. Right. I mean, I have uh, this phrase I tell quite a few people about that I heard and it really stuck with me that you become the five people that you spend the most time with. Exactly. And I feel there's something really deeply true about it in a mm. way that we don't actually understand yet. Yeah, so we got we got the the whole modeling that goes on with the parents, you know, which is psychotherapeutically and psychologically I think very well established that that is the case. You know, it's not just genetic, it's also the modeling that takes place emotionally and mentally uh, besides our beings, the way we breathe, the way we hold our bodies. Uh, facial expressions and so on. A lot of it's learned behaviour besides the genetic picture that we inherit, which is ancestral. Mm. So, you know, that five people theory, you know, the most influential ones that are going to be there, for me that feels absolutely right in terms mm. of, you know, what actually occurs. I think so as well. I think it's important for people as well to pay attention who those five people are. Yeah, and it, and it might be actually people you don't even suspect have had the most influence, you know. It can be how it is that we've identified with somebody because of a particular difficulty. How we identify with people is not necessarily just because we like them or because it is that they've had a, a positive uh, impact on our life. Sometimes identification comes about because it is that we've had a particularly strong difficulty with a particular character. And you would then identify with this character? You become what it is that you have trouble mm, with. Right, right. Since we're... Uh... You know, we've been talking about the near-death experience because you know that I, that's the easiest thing to call what happened to me, mm. just the blood pressure crash. But in the other interview, we very, very briefly touched upon, you said we're heading towards sort of the original matrix. And I didn't ask you at the time to expand on it, but because I saw a visual in my experience that's still one of the things that I've been trying to research what I actually saw in front of me, my own body disappeared from my awareness and I saw this infinite grid of energy balls that was flawlessly aligned, all set against black like outer space, a lattice of energy balls, each with a light green halo, a bright green halo around it, and all clearly active, almost looking like little bubbling waters, but very active energy balls. And, of course, afterwards, when I shared with a couple of people and I had two people with me, they said, it, you're describing The Matrix like the movie The Matrix. Mm. So since you use that word, I mean, can you shed light onto your thoughts about that? Yeah, there's two two things. that, I, And I, I do think that film is pretty uh, relevant to our time for the awakening experience to are we going to be machines or are we going to be humans that are really living a conscious uh, awareness on this earth at this point in time because the mechanical thing is actually something which threatens our humanity at this point in time. So that's one part of it and I really believe that th those films are relevant in that scoping. I think your vision is, is accurate in terms of you know what it is that we can awaken to and that awakening is, you know, that we have a choice within ourselves whether we want to become machines, whether we uh, want to be uh, just unconscious while it is with so-called awake, or we want to become more lucid. Um, you know, the, the principle of orosoma, A-U-R-A, -A, means many different things, but we could say simply it means light. The two letters in the middle of the first word, U R. So we say, well, partly what's been going on up until 2012 is like a, a unified reality. It's like a, a unified symbiosis that has been created uh, as the Earth has moved towards that zero point. Then after that point, suddenly something begins to shift. Instead of that unified reality where it is the, the collective dream was such and in a sense was mechanised, it was a, a mechanical reality. 
So then after that, something begins to occur. 2012 was the turning point when the Earth went through that galactic doorway. It went through the zero point. Since that time, the second word of Orosoma has in the middle OM, O-M, the original matrix as far as Orosoma is concerned. That original matrix is where we have a chance to awaken from just being machines, feeding ourselves, walking about, breathing, drinking, all of that, to being something else, to coming back to the original matrix, the purpose of coming into human form to realise the Godhead or to realise true consciousness or awareness. That's the original matrix, the original purposing of why God or why existence created this possibility and why seven billion souls have turned up for it at this point in time on this planet. And where have they all come from and why? The reason is to be able to get into this original matrix, the original purpose, God knowing himself or herself. The original matrix is the secret or the possibility of whatever it is, existence realising itself, not as a machine, but as something other, as something which is the true essence of the whole of the nature of existence itself, the creative impulse. Where do you think the OM actually came from? Because isn't it actually, there's some science in there as well, that the OM, when people chant, is actually the resonance of the planet? Yeah, it is. And I mean, you know, also another name for God. You know, in India, you, you everywhere you go, you will see the OM, you know, not just uh, in spiritual centres, but on buses, on lorries, everywhere. So, you know, it's a, it's a universal frequency, of the original matrix. And when you say God, I mean, I, I always, you know, myself personally, I have a difficult time ever ascribing that word because I feel it's excluding then a lot of people of other religions. So I, for myself, I definitely believe and have seen some sort of energetic force that is underneath our reality, but I don't feel comfortable giving it that name. When you say that name, do you think of it as literally you know, the, the the images we've seen in Bible study with a man and a white beard, or do you mean it as a word that represents some kind of consciousness? No, I, I, I'm very specific about it, and, and what I'd like to discuss there is, is conversations also with Vicky Wall, but I'll come to that in a minute. My understanding of God is three factors, generative, operative and destructive, the three principles of divinity. And all it is is a, an, an acronym, a, an abbreviation for those three principles, generative, operative and destructive. So, you know, for me, that's how it is. And there can't be an absolute unless it is everything's included in that absolute, light and shadow, you know, male, female, everything that is, is part of that absolute. There's no separation in the nature of what is an absolute. There must be a complete sense of unification. So in those three principles, generative, operative and destructive, I think is a good expression in a simplistic form of what it is that we encounter as part of the nature of existence. Mm. So I discussed with Vicky Wall because she she very much had... Uh, this uh, this expression of the father as part of her um, belief system, you know. And uh, I think I mentioned in uh, the first interview, we talked about how Vicky was somebody who it was very difficult to distinguish when she spoke about father, whether she was talking about her physical father or whether she was talking about God, because she used the same mm. sense of reverence uh, in mm. the intonation, in the tone, in the sort of devotional sense for both. Did you ask her? Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm which coming was to that she now. talking I'm coming to Come that. On, Mike. <laughs> coming to that, Natalie. Okay, Just sorry. Give me a break. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> So then, you know, I said to her, well, you know, what is God for you, you know? <laughs> and she said, well, I'll tell you an experience that I had. Uh, she said, I went very, very close to the source as far as I'm concerned. And she said, can you imagine a, a very intensely intricate clock with incredible gears, incredible workings and 
inside that clock, centrally, was a control room, which is monitoring moment to moment all of the workings of the cycles of time, all of the workings of the rotation of the planets and the celestial spheres, everything was monitored from within this control room. She said, for me, that's God. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's a very beautiful expression of an aspect of being. You know, if we can come to uh, an understanding of actually what she was describing, you know, the celestial movements of everything that is, you know, the way planets go around one another, the way uh, they rotate around the sun, mm. or the way in which uh, the Milky Way exists in space. You like know? clockwork. Like clockwork, in a sense. And, uh, you know, interpretation of consciousness of a direct experience from somebody who, you know, gave it as it was. I mean, she didn't wrap things up, you know, to uh, make them sound more elaborate than they were. And that's mm. the way she described it to me. Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, when I had my experience and I saw these energy balls, the feeling that I had was that I was in a control room. It was this, it felt very safe, but like business was going on. Mm -hmm. And I was just being given a glimpse at these operations. You can say something to her. <laughs> not when we've you're got, speaking. We've got Mike's family. No, 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 not when you're speaking, Natalie. Oh. <laughs> um, I guess it's a similar thing, you know, it's to what Vicky's saying. She's like, uh, it's like a clockwork. The operations are just going on. While we're doing our thing, some things are going on. Whatever we do, they're going to go on. And that was the feeling that I had seeing all these balls was, I mean, I still don't know what they actually were, but the sense was I was seeing behind the curtain this control room. Mm. But it didn't feel bad in any way. No, no. and the way yeah. she described it was benign. Yeah. Very much so. And I think that... Um... You know, it wasn't the only conversation I had about the nature of God with her. You know, she also perceived God uh, as a light force uh, in uh, plants, in trees, in uh, in everything that is. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I don't. Well, it's that energetic presence. Um, after I'd had this experience that I had f February 2012, for the next several days, more information was coming to me between three and four o'clock in the morning. And as this tapered off, I mean, I didn't know exactly when it was going to end, but after about day five, I kind of posed the question and I just said, look, I'm getting all this information. I have no idea why. So if anybody's actually listening, I'd like to know what, what exactly is the meaning of all of this and how are we supposed to live our life? And I got this very clear answer back just suddenly the answer was in me and it was that your heart is like a compass and when you feel that feeling of goodness in your heart that bloom which for me for example when I think of my dog I feel this expansion of energy in my heart that this is a compass. Same three letters you know D-O-G. Exactly exactly D-O-G um, but that the whole literally your compass of life is following that feeling in your heart. Whatever mm. is generating that goodness in your heart, that bloom that you feel when you look at a loved one or your dog. <laughs> um, and, of course, then I thought as well, well, if it's about goodness, you've got good, well, that's not a big stretch from the word God. And so I wondered if this could have been part of the origins of this word simply from the word goodness you know yeah and and another thing you know vicky loved to do was to play with words and one of the the word plays she was very fond of was that god good thing mm. Mm. the the remember and uh, the different reads she would in early workshops ask people uh, you know think of as many words as you can uh, that begin with re and, of course, RE to me was religious education, you know. Oh, OK. <laughs> I think of red straight away. Yeah. Red's a right answer, isn't it, Mike? It is. <laughs> it is, absolutely. <laughs> Probably means something really cool. Well, it, I mean, you know, I think these things are uh, f very much to do with how colour 
influences our core being or our core consciousness. And that's something which is uh, really what uh, the work with Aurasoma gives the opportunity to open up to. Do you find that people of all faiths are drawn to Aurasoma? Yeah, I mean, very much that uh, it doesn't have any particular belief system uh, prejudices. You know, I think it's more... Uh, easy for Buddhists, for Christians, uh, possibly than uh, somebody who has been brought up within the Islamic faith. The reason for that is that it's very, very easy uh, to have prejudices about things, you know, particularly uh, that are are part of the doctrine of Islam. Hmm. I mean... What do you make of what's happening today? Is everybody I think, got I think a right that, to be... Should everybody be paranoid and afraid, like what's happening and presented to us in the news? I think that there's, a, there's forces that are manipulating consciousness at this point in time which have agendas that are, are also going to straighten things out. That's fine. Yeah. No, thank you. Okay. This is very exciting. Mm. It's the paparazzi. <laughs> There are forces at work. There are evil forces at work. <laughs> no, she bought breakfast last time. Yeah, yeah but then she evil. took it away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she did take it away. So these forces, I mean, where are the forces coming from? Are we part of them in ourselves? I think that in the emergence of something new, then it's likely that what it is that's retained the shadow and the unconsciousness that's been is likely wanting to exert itself in ways that are going to be quite destructive as it feels threatened by the incoming forces of light. Mm. Do you think we all carry a part of what is going on globally? Well, don't, yes, I mean... We're I think all, my, like holographic, we're all yeah, part we're of all the whole. We're all microcosmic aren't we? we? We reflect it all. Um, nothing that is, is not in us mm. at some level. I feel that too. I, I watched a film and I believe it was called Chimatica a few years ago, right after the experience when I was plunged into research. And it had some horrible imagery in the film, but I really felt that we're all, we all have to slightly answer even on, even if it's a tiny fraction of ourselves, we need to look at in what way do we have a feeling that could be a part of that occurrence? You know, what are we resenting or what do we hate or what would we wish to destruct, mm. you know? And, uh, yes, it, uh, I mean, I, I think that the big key is, you know, non-judgment. Mm. And one of the difficulties uh, that uh, we face as human beings is not to judge other people's belief systems. Vicky was quite strong on that as well. She said, I don't mind what anybody believes, as long as it is they're not asking me to necessarily follow their belief. Right. I wish that the, the creed of the planet was simply you can believe whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt other people. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Um, well, we've evolved very organically then to what we were going to be talking about, mm. which was the Kabbalah. Now, was the Kabbalah something you already had some knowledge of prior to meeting Vicky? Yeah, I was uh, at, when I was in teacher training. Uh, I ended up just coincidentally living in a household of um, a Jewish uh, ballerina uh, called Maria Belinska. Uh, she was uh, very much involved in the Kabbalistic tradition. And I spent many evenings uh, in conversation with her and she had suggested readings uh, for me that uh, were very, very helpful to um, begin to understand what it was that the essence of Kabbalah was all about. So the combination of a, a sort of oral transmission from her which was... Um, presumably her Russian-Armenian background and uh, her uh, her faith from her, her father um, and 
the the readings that she suggested, which perhaps I wouldn't have come across otherwise, um, gave me the background in Kabbalah that then helped me to to realise that though Vicky hadn't studied it, uh, that what she was receiving and how she was in able to integrate it into the system of Orosoma uh, was coming directly from her physical father, who she always spoke of as being a, a Kabbalistic master, besides uh, being somebody who was schooled in the Hasidic tradition of Judaism. I mean, there seems to be this sort of um, association with the Kabbalah, that it's very mysterious and esoteric. Uh, is there is there truth to that, or the secrets hidden in the Kabbalah? Well, I mean, the more the more I've gone into it, and uh, you know, I, I know some some people who are deeply uh, steeped in it. Um, then, what I understand it to really mean is to be receptive, hmm. and the the meaning of Kabbalah is receptivity. Is that literally the meaning of the word? That's the meaning of what it is to be a Kabbalist, what it is that the system of Kabbalah is, to be able to be fully receptive. Is the Kabbalah literally a, a practice or is it a religion? I would say it's a, a, a means of openness to be able to understand what it is that's there to be received. So basically anybody of any denomination or faith could learn and study the Kabbalah. It's, I mean, it's got a big tie to the Jewish uh, faith, but I believe that that's sort of just by how things evolved, that it was yeah, around you could, you could, long you could before equally that. Say, Natalie, you could easily say, well, it's got a big tie to the Western magical tradition. It's got a big tie uh, to the roots of, of magic in the world, uh, equally as it has being something which is a core system uh, within esoteric Judaism. Mm. So I don't think it's got an exclusivity. A lot mm. of the uh, understanding of it and classification has come uh, through Judaism, but I don't think that Kabbalah was something exclusively Judaic. I think that I've also talked to Sufis within uh, uh, the core of the, the Sufi tradition that also have an intimate and deep knowledge of Kabbalah, which definitely is not associated with Judaism. It's what I just said, Mike. Yes, yeah, in another word, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's open to anybody of any faith. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll tap the, you on the knee. <laughs> the, yes. The... Uh, the uh, the, the diagram which is mostly associated with Kabbalah, which is called the Tree of Life, and, you know, in the West uh, we tend to think of that as kind of a symbol of the, uh, the Kabbalistic tradition. I think that diagram is a very, very important um, diagram and far underestimated in terms of its its capabilities and its potential, because it's a way of ordering our experience and understanding in a coherent way, which without that sort of mind map, that map of consciousness, uh, it's difficult to pull things together uh, in the way in which, uh, through that diagram, it is possible. So what I mean by that is uh, each... A circle and each path that joins the 10 circles, the 22 paths, the 10 spheres, have interconnectivity and solidity, which is like an empty filing cabinet. What we put in that filing cabinet in terms of our understanding, what it is that we put into those various spheres, yes, there's been a tradition, yes, there's been uh, particular attributions which are helpful in relation to the file headings that we might uh, begin to associate with those particular things. And again, you know, microcosmically, it's also a diagram of our physicality which relates very well to uh, the chakra system of the uh, the Indian or the, the Vedic traditions. And it also relates very much to the polarities uh, that exist that go into 
things like the understanding of uh, acupuncture or the understanding of the meridian systems of the body. So many, many different levels, a simplistic view of a, a receptive uh, filing cabinet that we can put into whatever it is that I experience to have a coherence to that experience, which helps us then to order it and access it more effectively than uh, without that more difficult if it is that we're only... Um, having our experience gathered in a more arbitrary way. Mm. Sounds a very uh, ele elegant explanation. Mm. Well done. Nice job. I've been, I've been thinking about that since um, you, you asked me. Have you been rehearsing? Me. Yes. I've been, <laughs> I've been standing in front of the mirror and thinking about you um, uh, and what I was going to say to you about the Kabbalah, and that's, uh, that's, that's my little speech about that. Well, you did very well. Um, <laughs> Is it your phone that's buzzing? I thought I'd put mine to silent. Is yours? Uh, is mine it yours? Is, mine, mine, is, mine is on a on a um, a thing that a, just says nothing. It's, it's, so it doesn't even buzz, right? No, nothing. Because I keep hearing a buzz, but I put. It's probably my iPad, is it? Oh. We could turn that off. I was going to say, is it the kids? Yeah, it's probably they're, they're fully <laughs> they're the fully kids? hooked up the whole and time. And their devices. <laughs> yeah, you're not buzzing. Um, well. I uh, first was exposed to Kabbalah, um, obviously after my, you know, crazy experience, which certainly changed my life, not coming from a scientific background, because I spoke information and the very first thing that I said uh, in front of two people was, everything is an illusion, it is all our perception of an infinite range of frequencies and vibrations. And then and I carried what, that's on. That's what Tesla said, wasn't it? Well, apparently, it's what a lot of people say. Yeah, but particularly Tesla was very hot on perception in relation to frequency and vibration was the secret of uh, life, the universe and everything. That was mm. his big deal. Mm. Well, through my very being, which had visually disappeared, but I felt everything I said to be the absolute truth. Mm. Now... You know, I had no science background, but I felt compelled to even the people close to me afterwards to try and let them in on this secret. You know, everything's an illusion. I know this, but I don't have any way to back it up right now. So I started researching ferociously from a scientific uh, point of view. And the first thing I came up upon was literally scientists and physicists saying Everything is an illusion. That's according to modern science and physics right now. There is no solid matter. And I was Googling these words frantically. Everything is an illusion. And I came up with people ranging from Eckhart Tolle to David Icke. And then the Kabbalah popped up and somebody um, facilitated that I was able to watch this Kabbalah course on DVD. And the very first opening class, the guy says, everything is an illusion. So that was my first little light bulb going off of, OK, as far as I'm concerned, everybody who's saying everything is an illusion, they're on to something. And I want to hear more about what they have to say, you know. So back to you, because yeah, you know the... way more about it than me. <laughs> no, I don't know about way more, but I mean, Maya as an Indian concept means everything is an illusion, a core concept within the whole of the ancient Vedas. So you've got Maya as being the whole of the nature of existence as being illusory. We create it through our own perception of it. Mm. And it's like saying, well, the nature of the mind is illusory. And every desire, every um, thought, every feeling creates the illusion that we enter into. If we want to become more lucid, if we want to become more aware, then perhaps what has to happen is that some of that illusion has to be dispelled. Something has to be clarified from within it to go beyond the illusion, to go beyond the mind, to become into awareness or consciousness, which is beyond the illusory state. Mm. Did you rehearse that too? No. <laughs> that was spontaneous. Jason, could your <laughs> iPad be vibrating? Yeah, and it's quite loud. If you could yeah. check it's not your iPad. 
See, our illusion is creating a vibration. I've, I've switched it off now. Okay. <laughs> Off's good. Off's good, it's yeah. It's amazing how many things we've got to check now. <laughs> Right. Yes, and I, I've got uh, I've got several phones as well as the the iPad and. Uh, Why have you got several phones, Mike? Um, because when one runs out of battery and I'm wanting to communicate somewhere, then it's better to have reserves. I mean, how many are we talking here? Two or more? <laughs> three. three. Three phones. Only drug dealers have three phones. Well, I, what I do is sim- similar to drug dealing. In that You're line. pushing consciousness <laughs> and awareness. Yeah, I mean, you know, you either want to be in it or you are not, don't want to be in it. You can't be half in it. So you're a kingpin. Yeah. You're a kingpin of consciousness with well, your yeah. three phones. Nobody's trying to communicate with me. <laughs> well, we'll see. All right. Right. Well, back to the, um, this. Right. Now, the tree of life... Um, Thank you, listeners, for bearing with us. Yes, you can cut all that out, Natalie. Um, I probably won't. (laughs) Um, The Tree of Life I've seen in some documentaries, and isn't there some kind of a freaky thing where if if it's viewed three-dimensionally from above, it looks like the flower of life? Jacob's Ladder. Oh, We'll see. We're back to you again. So I don't know about Jacob's Ladder. I've heard of it. It exists not only in one world, but it exists in four worlds. Oh. So you've got a basic two-dimensional diagram, which is 10 spheres with 22 pars, and then you've got that in four worlds. So you've got it in the earth world, the water world, the air world, and the fire world. So these are the elements of what it is that create all of our experience. You can say those four elements are the basis uh, we find ourselves in, in Mm. physicality. Uh, Every aspect of consciousness is an expression of the interaction of those four elements. When I talk about lucidity, I'm talking about something which goes beyond the candors, goes beyond the elements, goes beyond the four worlds. So archetypically, the fire world contains all of the archetypes of everything that is. So the 10 spheres and the 22 paths in the fire world are something which is archetypal. When it translates into the air world, that becomes mental. It becomes our understanding in the mental plane. When it's translated into the water world, it becomes our feeling or emotional base. When it's translated into the earth world, it becomes the understanding within our physicality. So the Jacob's Ladder approach is the interconnection of those four worlds and they don't just sit on top of one another, they're slightly staggered. And that staggering is what it is that connects, uh, for example, uh, Malkuth in one world with uh, Tifereth in another world or the bottom sphere uh, in one world to the middle sphere in another world. It's that kind of interaction which becomes very interesting in relation to the interaction of the elements and the way the worlds interact. What Orosoma does in relation to the way it fits into the, the Kabbalah, the tree of life and so on, is just to give very, very simple colour combinations which represent the paths and the points of stability called the syrup or spheres on the tree and the way in which they interact through these four worlds. So when it was that we realised that the first 78 bottles actually do a direct interface with those four worlds, the 22 paths, the 10 spheres in the four worlds, then it was really an amazing sort of aha moment. It was one of those... Uh, rare ones in life when you realise that this creation that's been given in terms of these funny little bottles actually interfaces with a very ancient system and that ancient system is being re-evaluated in relation to consciousness through what is being given through these bottles. Now, if, as it is said, that Vicky received it from her father and he was a Kabbalistic master then maybe part of the difficulty in communication between them, you know, when she was 14 years old and she left home with just the coat on her back because of the abuse of her stepmother, then what actually happened was that he was her beloved. She was his prodigy in that she was the one that had the gifts that he had, that he, his sons, the other seven children, you know, the, the six others, they 
didn't have those gifts that she had. So when she left home and she uh, was actually denied even existence, hasidically, uh. what it means if a, a Jewish girl leaves home, particularly if she goes and lives in a Gentile household, it's not like she's she's died or... Uh, she's not to be talked about, it's actually that she never existed. And oh. so in the family, that whole thing, you know, whatever the dogma, whatever the belief system, so strong, and imagine that psychic link, the love between the two of them, and then that opening up as his passing. And, I mean, Orosoma was born uh, literally the year after he made his transition. You think, well, if she received it, from a Kabbalistic master, part of what it was that she received may be also the reason why that interface between Orosoma and the Tree of Life is so strong. Yeah, that would absolutely make sense. Yeah, for me. And so you're saying that you didn't actually consciously recognise this connection to the Kabbalah till way down the Orosoma line? Oh, very much. It was only really being um, clarified at the point Vicky was making her transition. So we discussed it and we looked at it and it was beginning to come into being, but it was not until after she passed that the whole thing really got clear. And it was for me, her inspiration from the other side and what it was that occurred in her journey towards the light, that it was that brought all of that information into clarity as to what we present as part of the information based within the system. So up until Bottle 77, she hadn't been kind of giving you all sorts of talks about the Kabbalah and what the different bottles meant as... She no, she'd no conscious education in the Kabbalah. Her, uh, her belief system was relatively um, uneducated in terms of the background from which she came. She, don't forget she'd been converted to Christianity, uh, you know, in her early years. And so she'd even worked in a Christian bookshop in Great Missenden and uh, been a... a <laughs> proselytising Christianity um, for quite a bit of her life in her spare time before she got involved with Subud. So Judaism coming back into her life post the birth of Orosoma was you know, a relatively recent thing and what she received about it wasn't through text because you know she had no bit part possibility to mm. be able to read it because uh, it wasn't something that was uh, you know, at that stage in her life possible. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. And so now you're yeah. fully on board with the ties and connections. Well, I mean, you know, part of my role as I saw it with her at that point in time, as it was when the quintessences were born, and I said, well, you know, those are the names of the the masters from the theosophical tradition. She had absolutely no idea that those were the names that uh, were... Uh, from Blavatsky and uh, J.G. Sennett and the early theosophists, she thought that these were names that had just been given to her. And, oh. you know, she was almost indignant uh, when it was that I said, oh, well, you know, and she said, well, I'd like to talk to those people because maybe somehow they've been able to see what I've written or what has been said by me about it, wow. you know, as though they were still around, you know. It was like how dare somebody sort of uh, use my information yeah. type of thing. Yeah, that's that's incredibly interesting. Yeah. Wow. And, I mean, it was like that with the, the, the birth of the whole of that sequence of bottles, which are the master bottles and with the quintessences that are attached to them. She really believed that she was having, a, let's say, original conscious interaction mm -hmm. that was exclusive. Well, it's a bit like me with my everything is an illusion statement and you casually say, well, that's what Tesla said. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I got that message. <laughs> yes, it becomes something very personal. Yeah. I think. Transcendent messages that are part of the collective, I think, when you have a personal experience of it, become almost like a possession, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned about the birth of the bottle. Um, when Vicky used to birth the bottles, were you with her or was it something very private? That no, she no, I was do? with her for many of the bottles up until 44 and then 
at 44, she sent me down to the little laboratory in her ex-housekeeper's house, and I think I described that experience of, you know, exactly the way she described it in her autobiography, as though other hands moved my hands. Hmm. Would there be a certain... Oh, I, I can't remember if I, I might have actually asked you this before, if there was a certain type time of day that these would occur. No, not So it could be any time. Mm. And would you feel a bit of an inspiration to go down and create? Or? No, more of a nervousness, really. Because you've done a lot of bottles now, so you'd feel nervous and something would tell you, oh, it's time to go to the lab. Yeah, I mean, that still happens, except that now I tell Lilith to go to the lab. So does Lilith <laughs> have to birth the bottles? Really? And so what numbers have you done from? Um, I think one eleven. Vanya was the first one. Is that one eleven? Yeah. So from one eleven. So the baton has already been passed again. In a sense, I think that, um, yeah, she's uh, she's been birthing them from uh, 111, although she has been part of it since she was uh, very, very small. I don't know whether we mentioned last time in uh, the interview that... When Lilith was born six weeks premature, the day before Devorah was uh, meant to open and we had international celebrities from the colour world coming from around the world, um, then uh, it was the big storm in England, uh, October the 14th, 1987. And... Uh, I think there were some trees uh, in Seven Oaks got blew down that were 150 years old. Oh. And, uh, anyway, I, I followed the ambulance to uh, Grimsby and uh, um, it was really intense weather. And uh, Lilith was born that night and then I drove back after she was born, after I'd seen her and, um, you know, Claudia was still dealing with the uh, the last part of... Uh, um, disgorging or whatever that process is called uh, with the placenta. And uh, I had to be back to make sure that Vicky got her injection that morning. So basically not a lot of sleep. But as soon as I got in the door, uh, you know, Vicky uh, was up and said, you know, where where have you been? What have you been doing? Because I was a little bit late, which was unusual. And I told her, well, Lilith had been born in the night. And she said, well, let's get ready to go. And I thought she meant, well, let's get ready to go to Devorah. This is, you know, like all the celebrities coming. You know, we must be ready for that. But no, she wanted to go and see Lilith. Ah. So, you know, we got up there um, an hour and a half later and uh, she held this little thing which was basically uh, Lilith uh, was a less than a two pounds oh bag of sugar. Gosh. And uh, and Vicky held her and said... Uh, I dedicate my life work to you and uh, and uh, this is something that, uh, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to uh, to offer to you. So, and that was fairly stunning, you know, after being through that experience of right. the, the premature birth and then, you know, there she is, you know, sort of a bit bigger than uh, a two pounds bag of sugar now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad <laughs> or heartwarming whatever it's a touching story <laughs> i think so yeah keep on with your rehearsed speech <laughs> should we have a little break natalie for a minute yeah. let's have a little break okay okay but you've got to promise not to say anything amazing <laughs> in the break all right, all right. <laughs> you got to just talk about like the weather okay the <laughs> <laughs> right people to do that Yeah, and it, other and it watermarks very easily as well. Yeah, yeah sixteen coats of paint. Well, if I could interrupt this spiritual <laughs> conversation to resume the episode, <laughs> thank you, boys. <laughs> um, so you do have an awesome car, though. I will yeah, say it's uh, spectacular. What year is it again? Your Bentley. Fifty six. Yeah. Fifty six. Mm. In the awesome. classic Bentley green. Classic right. Bentley green. No other color. All right. Well, we're paying our official tribute right now. Um, we're trying to fit in around you, Natalie. Sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt your discussion of paint on cars. <laughs> um, well, I know we have to wrap up pretty soon for your uh, busy schedule in London. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, your CEO, Sean Sargent, had mentioned 
about perfume because I was telling him how I love the, the smells of the products and maybe there's a correlation with why we like perfumes. And he casually said, well, you know, perfume's killing you, right? So perhaps you'd like to take over from there. Yes, I think that um, people's misconception uh, when it is that they're looking at perfume is that they're putting something on that is to do with plant materials or um in a lot of instances, it's nothing to do with plants. A lot of the uh, contemporary perfumes are based on coal tar products. In other words, uh, petroleum-based uh, um, products that are synthesised smells uh, that are based from the, the byproducts of coal tar. Um, it's, a, it's a peculiar thing, the... The derivation of the alcohol that's used is also a synthetic thing. Um, it's not generally in any way organic or anything to do with traditional uh, or the past of perfumery as it was um, developed in the world from ancient times. Uh, this is uh, a very often uh, wood alcohol and uh, it's... It's actually fairly toxic and Sean wasn't wrong when he said that it was deleterious to the liver because uh, the skin has a, has a semi-permeable membrane uh, through the limb system to the bloodstream. Uh, the liver does act as a filtration to what we put onto the surface of the skin, whether that's synthetic cosmetics or indeed perfumes. So the body doesn't know what to do with these coal tar products so it's uh, it's deleterious in relation to the liver function to be applying those things to the body uh, one of the things that we felt very very strongly and uh, it was begun in relation to to research uh, in Vicky's time was to create perfumes that were entirely plant based using organic alcohol and uh, we call the range that has been developed with one of the uh, key uh, developers uh, in uh, the world that uses Orosoma for each of their, their clients, a London-based company, um, they found that there were certain of the bottles that particular clients would be called to. And so what they found was the colour correlation with the, uh, the, the whole of their array of aromas from the essential oils gradually began to be uh, coherent. And so we, we produce a range called Pegasus, which is based on those common notes that were found from the client base of this uh, aromatherapy company mm. uh, that created individual perfumes for their clients. And, you know, as far as we're concerned, and uh, it's been now fairly well received in in the, uh, the, the industry, let's say, that uh, uh, we're the first organic producer um, that uses uh, entirely natural products within uh, the, uh, the, the whole of the perfume arena. Would that mean that there'd be a certain shelf life of these products? No, because alcohol is a natural preservative, whether it's organic or it's inorganic. How do you actually make alcohol? Well, it's a it's a process of distillation. You know that what happened in Prohibition and everybody had their own little still in the back garden in America. It's not a difficult process mm. to, to derive alcohol and, you know, brandy's produced in a, a similar way as it was thousands of years ago in France and, you know, many, many other uh, spirits around the world, whether that's a potato spirit in Ireland that was used during the... Uh, uh, the the lean years, then all of these things have always been how human beings have derived alcohol from plant material or from vegetables. And so when you say organic alcohol, you're distilling organic vegetables? Um, we, Yeah, I mean, organic means that it's not made from a synthetic sort. It's not made from something which is, uh, you know, like like petrol, say, you know, so, uh, a source which is inorganic. Hmm, OK. And um, so if somebody just goes to, you know, Harrods or a fancy department store and buys a branded perfume, 
of a famous name, which I don't have to say, we've seen millions of perfume bottles. How fast does that solution make its way to your liver when you spray it on I mean, it is actually factual that it's uh, within a matter of 10 minutes, it's already accessed uh, organs at a deep level within our metabolism. Oh, my goodness. That's a little bit terrifying. It is. And, I mean, people don't realise the consequence of their actions. And it's the same thing with what you put on your, your face when you're using cosmetics. You know, these things, you know, within 20 minutes, the liver can have detectable and actual compounds that were placed on the face within 20 minutes. Oh, my goodness. Would it, would it even be bad then any alcohol to spray on yourself? I mean, if you have a sensitive liver or a liver condition, should you avoid perfumes, even organic perfumes? I think, you know, it's a matter of a personal choice. But, you know, obviously some things are going to be better than other things. If the body, you know, is over thousands of years has dealt with uh, alcohol in, in some form or another, if it's from... Uh, 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 natural distillation and uh, uh, it comes from a natural source and it's uh, an organic alcohol, then I think there's a more of a chance of the body assimilating and accepting it than it is that if it's a synthesised source. Mm. I can't... Uh, my mind goes to now thinking if somebody's an alcoholic and they're not supposed to yeah, drink. I mean, uh, this question has come up, you know, for, for me over the last 30 years quite often is, well, what about the pomanders? Uh, they contain um, at least 30% alcohol. What about the use of those with alcohols? Well, you know, we've actually seen people and experienced people really get better in terms of their addiction uh, through using, for example, the the gold pomanda, and some of those addictions are obviously alcohol based. Mm. Do you think, in a way, it's a substitute? Breathing it in gives you a little bit of no. I, I don't. I, I think that you know our source of addiction within ourselves, what we become addicted to, is contained within the yellow gold area of ourselves. And if it is that that's supplemented, if that's balanced, mm. then it helps us to overcome the patterns of addiction. Right. I don't. I don't think anybody's ever uh, speculated on the possibility of becoming addicted to using a pomander. There's always a first, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> There's always a first. Um, Sean had told us a, a story about a perfume that had almost been created as a joke to make a point in the industry. Do you know the one I'm referring to? Yes, and I mean... Can you I, tell it? Because he no. wasn't on the uh, yes. microphone. And, I, and I, I, I wouldn't use the name, but it is well known that, you know, as a... What can we do to create something that is completely synthetic and what can we do to make it with the cheapest possible end of that synthetic range that will prove through branding and through advertising if the expenditure is sufficient to be able to uh, have it a customer base that uh, is prepared to, to pay uh, what would be the equivalent of a natural perfume uh, with obviously a much greater percentage of profit because uh, of it being completely synthetic, low-end uh, pr production and all of the expenditure on marketing. And the end of the story being that they did this, that they were able With to... With great success. They were able to sell a junky compound for a lot of money to make a point to their you know, the, the side of the company that wanted to use the high-end ingredients and they said, you don't need to do that. Spend your money on marketing instead and we can have people buy junk. Um, yeah, I think that I think these things, you know, on the one side it is a, a funny story, but I don't think these things are unusual. Most companies, when they're successful, diminish 
the expenditure of the value that's in the product and put the expenditure into the marketing and commercialization of the product. Mm. Orosoma ethically and otherwise is as it is that we've grown, as it is that we've become more successful, we've reinvested in the quality of what it is that goes into the product, not the other way around. In other words, we haven't spent on advertising, we haven't spent on branding, we haven't spent on uh, all of the things that would lead uh, in a conventional sense to more success. What we've done is we've invested back into the product and improved the quality week by week, month by month, year by year, because our investment is in the potential of what that product can be to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Having toured your lab, your farm, your facility, the thing that I was so blown away with was the level of quality and care from every point. I mean, even having a driver go to Switzerland so that the product that you get from Switzerland, your crystal essence, doesn't have to be shipped dramatically and unpredictably with a courier. So that we, we can courier. monitor what it is that... Uh, it's exposed to. Yeah, and that we know exactly the circumstances it's been in and if it has been in a situation that uh, has in any way interfered with the energetic components of that... Uh, then we can do things about it. Mm. Whereas if it's not in uh, inverted commas our control, uh, we're not in a position then to be able to uh, rectify anything that may have gone wrong. Mm. You know, so we want to know. You know, and this would apply to to anything that goes into our own products. We want to know source. We want to know what it is that's taken place, and we want to know. Uh, how it is that we can do better in the future. And it's not to say that we're at the end of the road. You know, 30 years to be able to uh, develop something which was, to me, a, an incredible gift of spirit given to a blind woman. You know, then now to know that this is completely unrecognisable from what it was that was given, but is very much in that same spirit and inspiration, but with a higher level of quality at every level of the process and what it is that's contained within it, then to me, you know, the distance and the journey to achieve that, in a sense, is really only just begun. Mm, which is incredible because I could put my hand on my heart and say the quality is unsurpassable from what I've seen, and yet you're still seeking, how can we make it better? Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, uh, only yesterday Lilith and I were talking about a uh, different aspect of uh, the, the cosmetics, uh, AOS products, and, and talking about upgrading uh, various ingredients within those and seeking support for, for what's beyond my personal knowledge, you know, which is not inextensive uh, for particular things which I'm not, you know, let's say 100% happy with, even though, you know, I know they're as good as it gets as mm, far as I'm aware right. at this point in time. Right. It's already probably the best, but you <laughs> still want to make it better. Exactly. Mike, is there anything else you wish to discuss before we close this interview? No, no, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're doing well and, and I look forward to any any future conversations that we might be able to have. And I, I feel that really we're, we're just beginning to unwrap some things that uh, I've wanted to express for for some time. And, and I've got a, a few inspirations that, that I would like to uh, suggest possibly for future interviews about personal experience, which I think could be very helpful, not only to the Orosoma community, but also uh, for those seeking self-improvement, self-growth and development in the times that are to come. Are you doing a teaser for a future episode? <laughs> Stay tuned, people, from Mike Booth. Coming soon. <laughs> Dramatic music here. <laughs> Thank you, Mike Booth. Mike Booth, everybody. It is so obvious that Mike wants to take over my show. Rumour has it he already has a title. It's called In the Booth with Mike. There, you heard it here first. 
Thank you, as always, to Mike uh, sharing his insights. Um, just a very enjoyable person to listen to and to be around. Thank you, guys, for your patience, first and foremost, for the show to return. And I can't even promise a regular schedule right now. But what I can promise is that I have a whole bunch of episodes ready to go. So it's just me getting over that procrastinating and trying to make thing, trying to wait until I can do a perfect job for you. And I just have to just do a job and not wait for it to be perfect. That's my thing. And I'm working on it. Uh, if you have iTunes, subscribe, and that way the episodes will just be there as they show up. Um, I do hope to get one awfully soon. No more waiting for several, several months. Again, if you want to convert some currency, jiggle around those pounds, those dollars, those little Canadian colorful things, and wherever you are in the world, you want to change your currency, go to thegreyescape.com forward slash cash. And in my opinion and my research, you'll get the best exchange rate and a free international money transfer. Who can go wrong there? TheGreyEscape.com forward slash cash. Take care, everybody. And thanks for listening to The Grey Escape. 